You're listening to Creating Great Grooming Dogs. I'm Chrissy Neumeyer-Smith. I'm a certified professional groomer, certified behavior consultant for canines, and certified professional dog trainer. And this, my friends and colleagues, is the podcast where grooming and training meet. In the spirit of Halloween, this segment is all about fear. You know, many of the behavior problems that we see on the table in the grooming room and the vet's office, those are fear-based, and the dogs are, are uncomfortable with something that we're doing. And it may not be that they're terrified, but certainly they're, they're worried, they're anxious, they're stressed out, and those are all things that when a dog is afraid their body starts to have a chemical response. Now, I'm not pretending to be a vet, and I'm not going to get into medical details, but I think that we're all familiar with terms like an adrenaline rush, or the fight or flight response, or a visceral reaction. The dog doesn't choose the way their body reacts when they're afraid. That part just happens, and it's very individual. Just like with us, you know, some people are easily startled and some people are not easily started. Some people can calm down faster than others can. So one of the things that I focus on when we're working with dogs is to help keep them calm because I want to avoid that physical response. If we keep them calm, we're avoiding fear. We're helping them be... um, relaxed for what we're doing. We're helping them remain focused on us. We're helping them learn because certainly when you're, when you're afraid, when you're having that, that chemical reaction, it's harder to learn. It's all about getting away or fighting back, right? Um, So one of the things that many people don't think about is that that, that physical chemical response can last for hours or even days it doesn't just go away when the scary thing stops. It doesn't just end. It's very hard to, to end that kind of chemical response. Some individuals are good at that. Some are not. Um, when your dog struggles with something like nail trimming, their body starts to react even if nothing hurts. Fear isn't necessarily because something hurt or because it ever hurt. It could just be um, the way they're being held. It could be just worrying about, is that going to hurt? But that fear can last for hours or even days, even if what we're doing was over in a few minutes, even if it only took a second, even if it involved treats, even if it involved balls and play and people that they trust. Fear is an interesting thing because it is not just what's going on in their head at that moment. It's also what's going on in their body, what their body is sparked to do when they become afraid. And animals that are normally very nice with people can act very out of character when their body's having a chemical reaction to fear. Um, You don't become aggressive with things that you're comfortable with. If a dog is comfortable with having somebody look in their ears, they aren't aggressive about it. And so that's what I mean by many of the aggressive problems that we see are also fear related. We want dogs to be comfortable with it. We want them to choose to be able to be cooperative with us. And that doesn't mean that they have to walk over and, you know, put the stethoscope up against their own chest, but they have to be able to allow us to touch them in a variety of ways and feel comfortable with the things that we need to do. And that's why avoiding fear is going to be our long-term goal. Now that we've talked a little bit about fear in the dogs, I want to give you some human examples. I think that when we relate to being afraid, it'll help us look at the dog that we're handling right now and have a better understanding of how to calm them down, how to help them through it, and also to feel a little bit more compassion for the fact that, you know, they're afraid. So here are some examples from a haunted house. I used to work in a haunted house and I really enjoyed it. We're going to have some fun here because, um, man, I love scaring people. <laughs> So for as much as I'm really good at calming people down and calming dogs down and keeping everything calm, it's really fun to get somebody scared. So here's an example of somebody who wanted to be there, was having a good time at a haunted house, but her startle response was so dramatic and she got so scared that she acted completely out of character. Um, she was she was in there walking with her grandkids. And I scared her bad enough that she turned around and took a swing at me that I actually had to block and duck. I mean, she was, she was serious. She was ready to kill the monster. And (laughs) she was instantly, instantly so entirely embarrassed by the fact that she had done this. And obviously it was out of character. And I laughed and I, I, you know, kind of whispered to her that the kids didn't see it because of course that was part of her concern. Like, oh my God. 
I'm here in a haunted house to get scared with the kids. And I just tried to punch somebody. And what did the kids see? The kids didn't see it. And I calmed her down again. And I asked if she wanted to, you know, be escorted out of the house or if she wanted to continue. And she calmed down enough. She was able to continue. That type of dramatic instant response, I think, is kind of what we see when we suddenly turn on a loud noise. And the dog just jumps out of their skin, you know, tech talk, jumps out of their skin, um, that they're instantly like, whoa, what was that? Right. And that's a type of fear. And think about the woman who tried to punch me <laughs> was really shaken by it, even though everything was fine. You know, and I jumped right in with, oh, it's OK. Sorry. You know, you don't you, know, you didn't hurt me and the kids are all right. You know, they didn't even see it. Relax. You know, you can't just say, oh, that was silly and relax. So. As an example of what happens with our dogs, too, when you suddenly turn on a, a something or they suddenly realize that the thing up against their skin vibrates, right? Um, the, the corner of a clipper could be a really strange feeling that is really scary. Even though we tend to not think of those things as scary, they are. So another example from the haunted house <laughs> is building fear. Man, I wanted to build some fear. Another year I was... I was acting um, up in the, as a patron, I was acting up in the parking lot and just telling people, oh, my friend's chickened out. Can I go in with you? So they think I'm one of them and I'm getting them all keyed up and I'm all antsy and I'm all worried. And I notice every little thing that happens because I'm part of the cast. And we get in like two rooms into this big, huge haunted house and I've got them already worked up because they're with someone who's really, really paranoid. And then... A friend jumps out, grabs me, I get pulled away screaming, and then the screaming stops. I get pulled behind a curtain, and people are left shaken. Oh, wow. I thought they weren't allowed to touch us. Was she really with us? And from what I understand is that, because I talked to a bunch of them when they'd come out the other side, that they were so, so scared, the rest of the haunted house. Like, it primed the pump. It got them all worked up. So... That was a lot of fun, <laughs> but I want you to relate to that feeling of all worked up. Okay, now something scared you, and now you had to walk through the rest of the haunted house, and you know anything could happen. They've already shown anything could happen. So when we're building fear like that, um, I think that there are some examples in the grooming room and some examples at the vet's office that a dog starts getting a little bit wor worried and starts getting a little bit worried, and we just keep at it and keep at it and keep at it, right? That if they don't get a chance to calm down in between, they start getting a little bit more worried and more worried. And then it starts getting becoming really afraid. And I want you to think about times when we're afraid and the way that rea the animals react to us. So if we're already worried that we could get hurt while we're working with this animal, we're going to start showing a couple of signs of being afraid too, which just gets everything worked up even more, much like me guiding these patrons through, you know, through the yard and through a couple of rooms and jumping at everything. There was someone jumpy and they became jumpy. So for us to also be calm during, during sessions and during working with these dogs, even if it's at the vet's office or at the groomer or at home, you know, I'm not going to downplay things that happen at home. If we're really, really calm about putting an eye ointment at home, our dogs are also going to be able to be calmer with us. Um, so sometimes we are actively making things harder. And then we've got another example from the haunted house. There's, uh, there are times where someone thinks everything is calm and we can startle them and, and suddenly we're sparking some new fear. Like they thought everything was great. Everything was going well. Um, so we had this uh, spider room one year. It was a big giant spider and a whole bunch of like cocoons with, with mannequin pieces wrapped up. And everyone would come in and go, oh, well, this room doesn't look very scary. Until I called out, whispered out, help me, while I sprayed silly string across the room, which if, if you're in a dark area, silly string does look like a, a spider just threw webs at you. <laughs> And people would duck for cover, they'd jump, they'd grab each other and scream. And a second ago, they thought that room looked safe because I startled them. I got them so quickly. It was something so sudden that they freaked right out. Now, I want you to think about times when we're on the grooming table and everything's going great, but we think I'm going to just do it quick before he realizes what's going on. 
right? Um, maybe it's just a, oh, good, well, I'm scissoring his paw, and he's really, really good for that, so I'm just going to, while he's not paying attention, I'm going to grab the nail trimmers and crunch, right? And we have this crazy response because it's an awful lot like people ducking for cover when they see the silly string and hear someone whisper, um, which really is low-tech scare. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, <laughs> but with our dogs. Now that we've talked a little bit about fear in the haunted houses and some human reactions, I also want to talk about how do we help ourselves calm down when we are afraid. So imagine um, those same people at the haunted house. If somebody does need to be escorted out, the kind of things that we do are to like, all right, well, let's calm down and I'm going to have somebody in regular street clothes just walk through with you. And, you know, a flashlight and calm. Everybody's calm. Like, hey, guys, we're just escorting people out, which would happen once in a while with some of the younger kids. Sometimes a, a young kid would just get really, really scared. And um, the haunted house that I was in was in a castle museum. So it was um, already an interesting place. <laughs> so um, you think about calming somebody down. And some of that takes, all right, let's back off from all of the scary. Let's get you away from the thing that you thought was scary. Another example is... Um, I want you to think about the kind of things that we would do to help a child through a scary part of a movie. And that's the kind of mindset I want you to be in if you're working with an animal who has been known to be afraid of things, is to be thinking about how do I help somebody through something that they already think is going to be a little bit scary. So I'm going to use an example. I think most people have seen The Wizard of Oz, or at least most Americans have seen The Wizard of Oz. Um, so thinking back to that when you were a little kid, the flying monkeys ripping apart the scarecrow was pretty scary. And so before that came on, my parents would kind of be like, okay, here come the flying monkeys. But remember, it's just a movie. So everything's okay. And the scarecrow's going to be fine. <laughs> so I hope I'm not giving away the movie. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, if, if you think about the kind of things that you would do about, all right, you tell them ahead of time, you help them remain calm through it, and you're there to support and help them calm down if they did become afraid. And those are the kind of things that we would do with a child who is afraid of a movie. So we had the flying monkeys ripping apart the scarecrow. Um, we also had when the trees started getting angry that she picked an apple off of them. How would you like if somebody picked something off of you, little girl? You know. And <laughs> but again, if you know ahead of time, so in a grooming context, we know ahead of time. And I want you to start telling dogs, like, okay, loud noise before you turn something on. I actually work on loud noise pretty often, loud noise. In fact, I don't think I could turn on a blender in the empty house by myself without my dogs around, without saying loud noise before I turned it on. It's just such a habit now. If before I turn something on, I say loud noise. But it helps them understand. It's almost like saying, okay, this is the scene with the scary part, right? Because if you know the scary part's coming, you're not nearly as scared. And walking our dogs through the scary movie, walking the dogs through the haunted house and be thinking about, I want to help you stay calm so that you can still have fun with things that we're doing. And it may feel like it's so much more work, but it's because we're taking a different route. It's, because, it's almost like um, instead of taking the highway, you're taking some back roads that are a shortcut. Until you know the back roads, that probably doesn't feel like a shortcut. Because highway driving is pretty basic, and it seems very, very straightforward, and your brain doesn't have to respond as much. But when you get to know that shortcut, you're like, yeah, that does save me 10 minutes. Um, in our case, that shortcut or that other route is going to save us a whole bunch of heartache. So it's sort of like skipping the, um, the flooding and the construction site and the traffic and by going back roads. <laughs> and actually getting to where you want to be and be happier and more relaxed when you get there. So a lot of things going on on this episode with our Halloween podcast, but fear is such an important thing um, to talk about. And I want to mention, I realize we haven't really talked about training yet because I feel that this part is so important. Um, in training terms, we call this, you know, managing the environment. This is all parts of managing the environment, understanding the things that they're afraid of, understanding how to keep them calm, why we keep them calm, understanding how to talk to owners about why this is all necessary to add to this culture of we are going to teach the dogs to be safe. And so the management part is really important. Um, and by management, I mean we're preventing the problem from cropping up. 
And that's p a big portion of training, because if we just push, then we're always reacting. We're always just, you know, putting out fires. We're always just trying to respond to times when a dog got overwhelmed. And that's not the best use of our time. So the management stuff is, is talking to owners, making sure they're on board, making sure the dogs are calm, helping them be calm, figuring out what they're actually afraid of. Again, our subjective and objective, seeing what the story is and what we observe and helping them through these things so that we can also teach them. So don't worry, training is on the way too. But right now, all of these things are so important to training. They're the precursors to training. We're, we're kind of building the schoolhouse, all right? We are going to have fun with this. And next week, we're going to talk about more. For any of you out there who are looking for some one-on-one some -on -one help, we have these wonderful devices in our pockets, these phones that we can do live video with each other. I can definitely, definitely set up a lesson with you with the dog that you're having trouble with right there on your table and be able to guide you through some of this stuff. Um, definitely reach out and let me know. I am at Chrissy at happycritters.net. Um, certainly you can find me through the Creating Great Grooming Dogs um, Facebook group. And we can definitely set up times to work on these things together because you might be surprised how much I can do for you um, live where we're actually looking at each other, being able to observe what you're seeing, helping guide you, or even showing you on a dog over here on this end of video. So <laughs> there are ways for us to help each other. There are ways to learn this from a distance.